I've called my message today the results of the resurrection. The resurrection is the very cornerstone of the Christian faith. The resurrection is the foundation stone of what we believe. The resurrection dominates much of the New Testament. If you look for it, you'll see it just everywhere, and it's pictured and shadowed even in the Old Testament. It is the high point of the teaching of the Word of God. The resurrection is foundational to Christianity. Without it, we'd be just like every other man-made, man-orientated religion on the planet. But the empty tomb uh, teaches a totally different uh, teaching. In fact, um, the resurrection of Christianity puts Christians and Christianity in a class all of its own. We're separate. We're different. We're the only group that teach the resurrected, risen Savior. Every other group teaches some leader somewhere in some sepulcher, some tomb, some monument, somewhere. In fact, I've been to the Holy Land at least on two occasions, and I've stood in that very small tomb that they believe was the garden tomb. And as you stand there, you've got to be quite quick because you can imagine the queue of people behind you. But in those few brief moments that I stood there looking at an empty grave, and not only an empty grave, but someone very carefully had placed a little sign on the side, the words of the angels, which says, he is not here, he is risen. The tomb is empty, just as he promised. The resurrection is the driving force of the Christian church. The resurrection transformed the church from a small, frail group to a dynamic force that the Roman government could not change. In fact, the resurrection divides all of history before Christ and after Christ. It also affects your birthday. When you think of your birth date, whether it's 1960 or 65 or 1970 or 1985 or 2000 or whatever it might be, it always relates to the date from which our Lord was the time of the life, birth, death, and resurrection of Christ. It divides history. It's the greatest event in history. We come then to look at this marvelous uh, uh, subject of the resurrection. And the first thing I want to suggest as a result flowing from the resurrection is the transformation of the disciples. Uh, I like to use the word metamorphosis. For those who are watching online, you don't see the slides. And there's a slides up in the church of the little caterpillar that goes into a cocoon, turns into a moth, and then a beautiful butterfly. What a transformation. What a metamorphosis. And that's exactly what happened to the disciples. When Jesus was crucified, they were nowhere to be found. They were behind locked doors. They were dejected and depressed. They were heartbroken and forlorn. For three years, they had this amazing adventure with Jesus. But now, it had all come to an end. I give my age away when I mention this group, but the Seekers, anyone remember the Seekers? They were a good group who sang. And one of the songs they sang is, The Carnival is Over. The carnival is over. How it breaks my heart to leave. I want to tell you, Peter must have sung that to the disciples. The carnival is over. The adventure is over. After three years, it's all over. He's been crucified. He didn't keep his word. And you know what he did next? He took the others fishing, and I think that's very significant. If you notice in John's Gospel, chapter 21, they all went fishing. As it were, they were saying, we started off as fishermen. We had this three-year adventure. Let's go back to our fishing because it didn't work out. He had to meet them as fishermen on the shore of Galilee. But then... Strange things began to happen. Some of the women came running back. It's interesting, the disciples were hiding behind closed doors, but the women were there at the cross, and the women were first at the tomb. Some of those women came back and said, we've seen him, we've met him, 
The disciples didn't believe them at first. And it's interesting that the New Testament does that. Because in the New Testament times, women's testimony was never credited. But the gospel doesn't hold a distinction against men and women. So the first ones to meet the risen Christ were the women. And then the 11 disciples had an encounter with Jesus. And then 500 had an encounter at one time with him. And for 40 days, he was seen by people all over the place. Remember those two men walking dejected on the road uh, of Emmaus. And, and their hearts were broken. And their stranger meets them and walks with them. And their hearts are strangely moved as they realize it's Jesus. Oh, what a day it must have been. He appeared to many. If I said to you, this past week I had coffee with Michael Jordan, I wonder, you might think that's stretching it a little bit. But then if 10 people said, hey, they saw Ben at the restaurant having coffee with Michael Jordan. It starts to grab a bit of momentum. And then a hundred people say, no, well, hold on. We saw them chatting together after the restaurant at the car. And then another 500 people say, we saw Ben and Michael Jordan at the sports arena watching the, the, the rugby match uh, this past Saturday. Now it gets traction. Not only one person, not only 10 people, not only 100 people, but 500 people. If you work out in the Bible, about eight or 900 people saw him in that 40 days. It has an authenticity about it. This changed them. This transformed them. This energized them. This motivated them. They moved from being a frightened small group of men behind closed doors to being men who were brave, who were on fire, who were zealous, so much so, all of them, note this, all of them gave their life. All of them eventually gave their life for um, the truth of the gospel. They were transformed. Um, I love the words of Peter, who was once so frightened. He says this in Acts chapter 3 and verse 14. You, and now note Peter is talking to the religious leaders on this, at this occasion. Everybody cowered and scraped before the religious leaders because of their immense power. Peter, an unschooled fisherman, stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. And this is what he says in Acts chapter 3, 14. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer, Barabbas, to be replaced by him. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. That's fighting talk. He was bold. He was courageous. He was not fearful anymore because he had met the resurrected Christ. In fact, it goes on in Acts chapter 4. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection. And God's grace was powerfully with them. They turned their world upside down because they'd met the resurrected Christ. This truth continues to change the world. Do you know that there are 2.6 billion people claim to be Christians in our world. 2.6 billion people. One in three on the planet. One in three on the planet, to some extent, say they're Christians. Now, we don't get much of the um, publicity uh, in our own country, and the Christian church is downplayed and pushed aside as irrelevant. But that's just not true. One in three on the planet claim to be Christian. You need to come with me to third world countries and see the groundswell of Christianity, and it's growing exponentially. What causes all this? A lie? God forbid. It's the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. They couldn't keep quiet. And I trust, to some extent, as a Christian, in your family, in your place of work, Amongst your children and grandchildren, you can't keep quiet because your heart has been energized by a resurrected Christ.
Secondly, the second thing I want to point out to you is the dynamic possibility of prayer is now open to us because of the resurrection. The resurrected Christ, who rose again on the third day, gives us the opportunity, the possibility of effective prayer. Prayer is not just something hollow and empty and pointless and and words in the wind or wishful thinking. We may now pray effectively. Thousands, tens of thousands, millions in our world pray to stone statues, pray to wooden idols, pray to pictures, pray sort of rote prayers, and, and, and there's just wishful thinking. We pray to a resurrected, risen Savior who hears us. I've walked the streets of Bangkok, and I'm sure some of you have as well. And what amazed me when I walked those streets is from time to time, amongst these most elaborate, beautiful glass buildings, there's a little alcove, and in the alcove is a little statue and an idol, and there's some some juice there and some food there for their God. And they come along and they pray to this, this statue God who has no ears to hear, no eyes to see, no hands to help. We don't pray like that. We pray to a risen, reigning Savior who hears. I've spent time in India preaching the gospel. And I remember on one occasion seeing an idol that was about four and a half stories high. It was massive. And people all gather around this massive statue, making an idol that big doesn't change the reality. It can't hear. But our Christ is risen. And you know what he says? The Bible says in uh, Hebrews chapter 4, For we do not have an high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's tempted in every way like us. That means he can understand. Tempted in every way like us, yet without sin. Therefore, therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. (laughs) Confidence that we might find grace to help us in our time of need. Isn't that amazing? Prayer isn't just this empty mouthing of words with a, with a hope tied to it, to some idol, but rather it's a prayer to a God who loves me, who understands me, and can intervene. And I have seen that. I have seen that in my 40 years of ministry, and I've seen that this this year already. I battle with prayer just the way you do. I struggle with it. I don't pray as I ought. I don't pray as I should. But this I can say, I have seen him intervene in my life even this year. I've seen him answer prayer again and again by his grace. What a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. The resurrection opens the door of heaven. It's lovely to see in uh, the book of the Revelation, chapter 4, it says in verse 1, For I saw in heaven a door standing open. Isn't that lovely? The door of heaven is open to you. If you love Christ, The door is open to you. He says, call unto me, and I will answer you. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Is that God's word to you today? Have you come into the church with a heavy heart, with a crushing load, with a family issue you can't deal with, with a health issue that's going out of control, with a loved one that you so love and they've gone so far from the Lord? You can speak to him and he hears and he will intervene in his time. He hears and answers prayer because the resurrection has given us a savior in heaven who hears our prayers. Well, the third thing I want to point out to you is the power of the Holy Spirit has been released on the church through the resurrection. You can't separate the resurrection and the release of the Holy Spirit. The Lord had to rise and had to ascend to set the Spirit free. And the Spirit now guides us and leads us and empowers us. The Holy Spirit made that early church a dynamo for himself and God continues to make the church a dynamo you think of the church how opposed it is 
how, how we have massive opposition and how Bibles are burnt and banned, but they can't stop the church because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it because it's energized by the Holy Spirit. The resurrection of Christ on the third day opened a new era for the church, the era of the Spirit. And we're in that era where the Holy Spirit is set free to work. Remember Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And again in John 14, he said, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you, to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. You see what Jesus is saying? He's going to the Father, but as he goes to the Father, he sends back the Holy Spirit, the heavenly advocate, the one who's with us, the one who empowers us. And I love the fact he says, I will send you another. And the Greek word there for another is another the same as. Sometimes out in the car park, there's cars, lots of them. One car, another car, another car. They're all different, but they're all cars. However, if you see that parking lot there in Ellerslie with Teslas, one Tesla, two Teslas, three Teslas, they're all exactly the same. And that's the word used here. I will send you another comforter. In other words, another one just like me. Not another one who's different from me, but one who's identical to me because he's the third member of the Trinity. And we have that Holy Spirit with us to empower us, to guide us, and to lead us. I'm confident that over 75% of you use GPS. It's, it's a great help. I remember those days where we had the maps. Have you still got a, a road map in your home? Maybe use it to stop the door slamming or whatever, but we don't use them anymore. And I remember often traveling with my wife, and it was the only time, the only time, we would get hot under the collar with each other. She hasn't got a good sense of direction, and sometimes the map book was upside down. She didn't know north and south and east and where, and it caused confusion. Thank God those days are over. We've got the GPS, and it just, just guides us. Do you know that the Bible says the Holy Spirit is our, and I say it with all due respect, our onboard GPS, to guide us into all the truth, to show us where there are dead ends and to show us where we ought to go. Our foolishness is that we don't listen to him. Sometimes I've said to Sue, don't listen to the GPS, I've got a shortcut. <laughs> it's normally the scenic route, the long way round. But you know, when you watch, listen to the GPS, it's normally right. And when you listen to the Holy Spirit, he's always right. One of the results of the resurrection of Christ is that the Spirit has come to energize the church and to guide the church. Oh, my dear friends, let's listen more carefully to what God says. Let's listen more carefully to what God says. Then there's uh, another uh, outworking and result of the resurrection. It just gets better. The forgiveness, the forgiving power of Christ. It is through the resurrection of Christ and his ascension that the floodgates of God's forgiveness is, is opened to us. Rivers of grace, rivers of grace flow to us. It's the resurrected Christ who has made the way of salvation open, that we can be forgiven. My dear friend, don't let that word wash over you. What some people would give just to know they're forgiven for the indiscretions of the past, for the foolishness at that party, for the, the foolishness of a dark moment in, in, a, in, a, in a time where they didn't consider the consequences of what they did and they live with a life of regret. We as Christians can know forgiveness. We can know what others do not know. The floodgates of God are open to us because of the resurrected Christ. The resurrected Christ gives us a forgiveness we could never know. And I came across an amazing verse that ties the resurrection and forgiveness together in one verse. I love it when you find that. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 16, it says this. This is the Apostle Paul arguing about the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, 
then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. See, he ties it together. If there's no resurrection, there's no forgiveness. But conversely, we must say, because there is a resurrection, there is a glorious forgiveness. The floodgates of God's forgiveness is given to us. Romans chapter 4 and verse 25. He has delivered us over from death and sin and has raised us to life and forgiveness, justification. Isn't that amazing? He has raised us that we might have forgiveness. Full, free, lasting, expansive, extensive, endless forgiveness is available to us. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies and purifies and purifies us from all unrighteousness. I remember hearing of an uh, art exhibition, and the artists left their pictures at the exhibition, and all these paintings were very beautiful paintings, and they all had titles. However, one artist who had painted a magnificent picture of this huge waterfall, probably was the Niagara Falls, huge waterfall with all this water cascading down, there was no title. And for them to advertise the artworks in the brochure, they needed a title. So they looked and looked at the artwork and they said, well, let's make up a title. And one of them came up with this. More water to follow. More water to follow. If you know the Niagara Falls, there's masses of water. That's what I want to say about forgiveness. If you've been forgiveness, there's more forgiveness to follow. You will never outdo, you'll never exhaust the forgiveness of God. He forgives all our sins and cleanses all our iniquities. Isn't that amazing? For a troubled soul today, either on the web or here, for a troubled soul today, there is immense forgiveness in Christ. He died and rose for you. Will you note again, there's the hope of heaven. The resurrection guarantees a place in heaven for every sinner. Thank God for that. If Christ had not risen on the third day, if Christ had not kept his promise, there would be no prospect of eternal life. All of life would just be what we have, and we would be above all people to be pitied because life would be like many of the East eggs we're going to eat today, a little shell of promise and nothing inside. Life would be empty. But life is a whole new meaning, not only in this life, but in the life to come because of the resurrection. The Bible says Jesus is the first fruits. And it's a lovely term in the Old Testament. First fruit would be when you had a crop coming in, the first part of the crop, the best part of the crop, would be taken and given in the Lord's house. And then the whole harvest would be brought in. And it was a way of saying, Lord, we recognize that you have given us this crop. And Jesus is the first fruit. In other words, he's the first one raised, and there's a vast crop to be raised. And that's us. He will raise us as well. Without the resurrection, life is empty and hollow and meaningless. Shakespeare in his play Macbeth, which no doubt some of you endured at school like I did, was, uh, said these words, speaking about life. Out, out, brief candle. Life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets in his hour on the stage of life, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by a fool, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. A tale told by a fool, signifying nothing. You see, that's the emptiness of life outside of Christ. A tale told by a fool, signifying nothing. But we don't live like that with an emptiness. We have purpose. We have direction. We have um, uh, an Afrikaans word that's just got in my mind. Dual, purpose, direction, 
function, and that's given to us from the Lord Jesus. Remember those promised words of his as we close. Do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go there to prepare a place for you that I might come again and take you to be where I am also. The wonderful promise of heaven. Jesus said to that woman, I am the resurrection and the life. This glorious resurrection gives us hope beyond the grave and gives us hope for our loved ones. I can't wait one day to meet a whole lot of people that I've known and that I've buried, and I will see them one day, and the reunion will be amazing. Before long, the world will see me no more, Jesus says, but you will see me because I live, you will also live. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. As we draw to a close, do you have this hope? Do you know what it is to have sin forgiven? Do you know what it is to have the exciting adventure of knowing the presence of the Spirit of God in your life? Have you got that sense of confirmation that heaven hears you when you speak because you're one of his? Have you got that? For those of us who have, rejoice and thank the Lord, for we do not deserve it. It's all of grace, all of grace. But for those who do not yet have it, may I encourage you with all my heart to seek the Lord, to turn to him, to register on the Alpha course, to find out what this adventure that so many of us are on, how you too can join it, how you can be ex included. May I say on the authority of the word of God today, that outside of Christ, it is impossible. Outside of Christ, it is impossible. Just recently, I went off to Newmarket. I'm sure many of you have shopped there at Newmarket, lovely big shops, and you've um, got that lovely parking lot. Well, I took my car there, and I was convinced, I was certain my car was registered. I was certain that I'd put my name down on that fancy list, that when I go through the boom, it will open. Yeah, right. When I got down with a whole lot of cars behind me, the boom never opened. It just wouldn't rise. And then I uh, tried not to abuse the person on the, inter on the little phone thing and tell them, why isn't this opening? My name is down. And they said, sir, your name is not down. Your name is not down. As much as I argued, as much as I believed my name was down, the boom didn't open. And all of those behind me were very annoyed. And may I say that the boom of heaven will not swing open to you if your name is not down. It's not the church will put your name down. It's not communion that will put your name down. It's not confirmation. It's not how much you've given to the church. It's not how many times you've attended the church. It's not who your mother was or your father was, despite the fact that they were missionaries. That is irrelevant. It's have you surrendered your life to Christ? Have you asked him to write your name down in the Lamb's book of life in heaven's register that on that great day, heaven's door might open to you? All the wishful thinking, all the religion in the world, all the kindness to others, all the giving will not put your name down. You say, Pastor, how can I get my name down? It's Christ and Christ alone. As we trust him, as we commit to him, he will write our name down in heaven's register. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you do that today, he will save you. Let us close in prayer. Just a moment for you to think. There are many in our church who are saying, Lord, thank you for the resurrection. Thank you that you've forgiven me through it. You've given me the spirit. You've given me the hope of heaven. Thank you, thank you, thank you.
But there are some here who are uncertain. Some here who need to surrender to Christ. Some here who know that that boom may not open to them. Will you surrender your life to Christ? Will you repent of your sin and turn to him? He will not turn you away. Is today the day of salvation for you? You need to write your name down on that list and attend the course that you might find freedom in Christ. Lord, thank you for this resurrection morning. Thank you that we've been able to celebrate the implications of the resurrection. And we pray, O oh Lord, that as we leave this place, we might not go as the defeated people of God, but as the victorious people energized by the Spirit of God. And we pray for those we know and love who haven't yet surrendered to you or have grown cold, that they would turn back with full zeal and find you willing with rivers of grace, more to come to forgive them. In Jesus' name, amen.